There is now clearly uh, a, a major confrontation with, with Russia. And if you look at, you know, at, at Russia from a NATO perspective, uh, uh, you're going to lose a lot of sleep because here you have a country which is militarizing, uh, where uh, children in school, once again, are taught to use weapons, you know, military training, where uh, Russia today is spending a greater percentage, percentage of its GDP uh, on defense than even the Soviet Union. It, it's mobilizing hundreds of thousands of troops. It, it's you know, creating a sort of war society and not just a war economy. Putin, to keep in power, has constantly to be involved in a war somewhere, uh, given the way you, you said at the beginning. He sort of conceptualized this as an existential threat to Russia, uh, Russia being invaded, you know, threatened from all sides. So given that, uh, you know, NATO has to also, of course, be prepared uh, to deal with that kind of uh, neighbor. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And this time we are joined by a former Deputy Assistant Secretary General for NATO with 38 years experience as a member of the Alliance's international staff. Dr. Jamie Shea has been a spokesperson for three Secretary Generals and he's now a Professor of Strategy and Security at the University of Exeter. Dr. Shea, good to speak to you. Thank you for your time today. Uh, good to be back on the programme, Kate. Thank you for the invitation. And Jamie, we're speaking as the largest NATO exercise, Steadfast Defender, gets underway, involving 90,000 troops from 31 allies plus Sweden. What more can you tell us about this exercise and its significance? Well, uh, Kate, as you know, since NATO uh, pulled out of, uh, of Afghanistan three years ago, uh, and then, of course, uh, we had uh, Putin's two invasions of Ukraine, the first in uh, back in uh, 2014, and then, of course, the much more major invasion that took place uh, in, in 2022, NATO has had to go back to collective defence, the old original task of the alliance. Uh, but, of course, it's more complicated today because, uh, for example, the border that NATO now has with Russia is four times longer than it was at the end of the Cold War, particularly now that Sweden has joined the alliance. And NATO has gone from 15 members, as you said, to 31. So there are a lot more countries to defend as well. Uh, and of course, uh, against a resurgent uh, uh, Russia. So what has happened is, is that when NATO had a summit in, in Vilnius last July, um, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, General Cavoli, uh, drew up uh, a new defense plan for NATO, a new uh, so-called regional plans to make sure that, you know, should NATO uh, be called upon to fight, uh, it would be able to do so. It would have forces in place to hold the line. It would be able to mobilize forces uh, from North America right the way across Europe into Finland, the Baltic states, into Poland, Romania, on the Black Sea, and so on. And then General Cavoli said, look, you know, henceforth, if we're going to have an exercise, uh, we've got to use the exercise to benchmark our ability to deliver on the plan. You know, uh, are the Allies really able to mobilize quickly? The tanks, the armored personnel carriers, the aircraft, can they get the ammunition uh, transported on railway lines across Europe? Let's test it. Uh, let's see where we are. Uh, so at the end of the exercise, we'll have an answer. You know, if we are called on to fight tomorrow, can we do it or do we still have big gaps? So Steadfast Defender is now the first big test uh, of NATO's new defence plan. And it's going to, I think, reveal lots of valuable lessons about what's working and what's not working in terms of NATO's ability uh, to practice defence. And it's going to be a long one, not only the 90,000 troops, but it's going to go on for five months. So in other words, it's also going to test for the first time since the end of the Cold War, not only NATO's ability to get people in the Baltic states in the first place, but to keep them there and to sustain them there for a long period, five months months on the assumption that, like in Ukraine, it's not going to be a quick affair and uh, any uh, conflict with Russia could last for a long time. And NATO's got to be prepared for uh, uh, endurance uh, as well as for mobility. And if the purpose is to demonstrate NATO's ability to deploy forces rapidly from North America and other parts of the alliance to reinforce the defence of Europe, how closely will President Putin be watching and what will he be looking for? Well, in the old days, uh, I would all be tempted, even Kate, to say the good old days when NATO still had a NATO-Russia Council cooperation with Russia, uh, Russian generals would have been invited as guests, uh, as observers of these exercises. And NATO, I remember when I was there, would have briefed uh, 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 Russian diplomats uh, weeks in advance about its exercises in order to build trust and transparency. But of course, un unfortunately, we're not there now. That's all gone. So uh, the Russians won't be invited. Any 
any more than NATO is invited to observe uh, their exercises. So Putin will no doubt use classical means, uh, Russian ships in the Baltics, in the, in the northern seas. Uh, it's not difficult for Russia because these exercises take place across a very wide expanse of geography. So, so if Russia can't observe them, for example, in the Black Sea, it will be able to observe them in the Baltic Sea or, or, or up in the Arctic. Of course, Russia has satellites uh, like uh, most advanced military powers these days. It has spy aircraft sensors, uh, the whole panoply of uh, information gathering. So yes, the Russians will be all over this, uh, particularly as they've known about it uh, for several months already. You know, this is not a snap exercise like what Russia does, these unannounced sudden exercises. NATO has been planning this for a long time. So I think, yes, NATO will gather a lot of information, but uh, so inevitably will be will Russia. And this is something that NATO will simply have to uh, factor in. Uh, when you get into a, a more confrontational environment, then of course, you know, learning about the other side's strengths and weaknesses becomes one of your top priorities. And this comes as Turkey has given its approval for Sweden to join NATO, with Hungary yet to sign off, I think, as we're speaking, although Viktor Orban has reportedly said he'll urge his parliament to do so at the earliest opportunity. How significant is, is Sweden, uh, the, the joining of NATO by Sweden? Well, I think, first of all, there's a political thing here. You know, Finland uh, uh, joined NATO uh, already uh, uh, last summer, uh, and so Sweden has been sort of left out in the cold. Although the two countries made a joint application to NATO, uh, you know, they're neighbours, of course, they've always worked together. And so the idea was that they would join uh, together. This hasn't happened. So, yes, it's been, frankly, an embarrassment for NATO that uh, two countries, Turkey and Hungary, have been uh, uh, holding up this process for over a year now, uh, when virtually every Everybody else, included, including the United States, you know, notwithstanding you know, sometimes feelings that the United States is less committed, but including the United States, you know, ratified the Swedish membership uh, immediately. So for NATO, I think it, it's important for you know, reasons of prestige, of credibility to get this done and not leave Sweden hanging out there in the cold any longer. But also at a time when, uh, as we uh, are in response to your previous question, we're talking about NATO and collective defence. Getting hold of Sweden's military capabilities and adding them to NATO is very important because, you know, like the Finns, the Swedes have taken their defence seriously. Uh, they have a small army, unlike Finland, which has a very big army, but the Swedes have a first-class air force. You know, they have an air defence industry. They produce their own fighter jet, the Gripen, which, uh, you know, is not easy for a small country to do these days. Um, and they also have an excellent submarine capability. Kate, you may remember from the Cold War days that the Swedes used to um, always spot Russian submarines, Soviet submarines mm -hmm. then, operating in their territorial waters. Um, uh, it was called Whiskey on the Rocks because one of the Russian submarines was a whiskey class submarine. Uh, and so the Swedes invested very heavily uh, in submarines and anti-submarine warfare capability. This is now a deficiency in NATO, uh, the time when we're going back to protecting the Atlantic and the sea lines of communication. So I think Sweden's uh, proficiency in, in, in anti-submarine warfare um, will, will help uh, uh, NATO a, a, a great deal. So there are good military reasons, but I think it's an issue of political credibility as well. Uh, NATO has just uh, this week finalised contracts for another $1.2 billion in artillery ammunition coming on the tail of similar contracts to supply more Patriot battery missiles. How important are, are these weapons, especially as the US continues to debate its support for Ukraine? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it's very important because what, what has happened is that since the uh, onset of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, uh, many countries, the United States, the European allies have been using up their stocks of weapons. I mean, that was the obvious thing to do. You know, the, uh, the weapon you have, you know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. So the weapon you have can be you know, shipped from your warehouse uh, or taken from a military unit uh, and uh, shipped to Ukraine fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, uh, but one, of, one, I think, big uh, mistake uh, that uh, the allies have made is not realizing that those stocks would run out. And if you wanted to continue, you needed to start war production. Uh, and what the Allies have suddenly discovered now that they want to restart war production is that the defence industries have shriveled. Uh, they've uh, stopped producing many of these pieces of equipment because they felt, you know, that there would not be a market for them uh, any longer. The design teams, you know, the, the, the raw materials, the explosives, everything you need uh, is no longer there. So the Allies have woken up to the fact that you, you can't simply switch on the tap and restart war production. Even these um, one 
155, these 225,000 155 millimeter artillery shells that you were talking about will take 24 months, 24 months uh, to manufacture, mm -hmm. and then probably another six months to ship to Ukraine. So it, it's good that NATO is now uh, taking this seriously. And the EU, by the way, has a similar plan to spend 1 billion uh, uh, euros to uh, procure 1 million, even more, four times the number of 155 millimeter shells for, for Ukraine. But uh, the EU so far, simply going around work, the world, finding out who's got them, who's willing to sell them, has only been able to yeah. come up with 300,000, very short of the 1 million. So uh, there's going to be a gap um, uh, between running down existing stocks, which is happening already, uh, and the ability then to say to Ukrainians, but don't worry, you know, the new tanks, the new artillery shells from war production uh, is going to begin. And I think the key challenge uh, now as we enter 2024, is how do the North American and the European allies plug that gap so that the Ukrainians can continue to fight and not be defeated by Russia? Uh, they don't run out of ammunition, which is the big problem, I think, for Ukraine at the moment. We keep them in the fight. So uh, until such time as you know the, the, the defense industries, think of World War II, ramp back up again uh, and there'll be supplies. The other thing it, with war production, Kate, very briefly, is because many NATO countries, including the UK, have run down their stocks. As production starts, you know, ministers of defense are going to be saying, well, you know, can we afford to give it all to Ukraine? Because we've got Russia now, uh, which is also a threat to NATO, potentially. Uh, you know, we, we also have to make sure our own armed forces are well supplied. So, for example, if you look at that NATO allocation that you were speaking of, 50% uh, hopefully will go to Ukraine, but 50% will be held back to uh, backfill, to use the military term, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, depleted stock of NATO countries themselves. So this is, you know, so th th these logistic ammunition issues are really going to be key in 2024. Uh, President Putin's premise for launching the all-out invasion of Ukraine was to defend against his imagined threat posed uh, what he thought was, was saying was an expansionist NATO. What do you think um, events in the US with the presidency, the presidential elections, what would a Donald Trump presidency do to NATO? Well, uh, I, I suppose, and I'm speaking to you from Brussels, that there's a lot of anxiety, uh, of course, among diplomats uh, about the return of President Trump. I mean, it was not easy the last time that he occupied the White House. Now, of course, the first thing to say is the worst didn't happen. You know, he, he made lots of uh, 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 rhetorical statements, but at the end of the day, he didn't withdraw from NATO. Secondly, a lot of the threats to withdraw from NATO were really Trump, uh, very skillfully, I have to say, because he's not an un skillful politician, uh, using this threat to get the Europeans to ramp up their defence uh, spending, you know, by putting the fear into them that they would finally take the NATO commitment seriously, which all of the Allies made. Um, before Trump became president, to spend 2% of their GDP on defence. And this fear factor certainly had an impact because the Allies went then, when Trump became president, from only three of them spending 2% of GDP on defence to today about 11 or 12. So still not perfect. Mm. But uh, if you look at you know, what my old boss, the Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, says, you know, the, the Europeans have ramped up uh, alone, not the US, the Europeans, uh, uh, defence spending uh, uh, since uh, 2014 by, you know, upwards of 400 billion extra dollars. Um, uh, and so if you were Trump, you could say, hey, look, you know, I managed to get these Europeans to take this seriously in the way that my predecessors, who were much gentler and didn't use shock therapy, weren't able to do. So if, if this is where we are, if Trump comes back, um, I sort of think the Europeans could probably present better arguments saying, Mr. President, look, you know, we're, we're ordering new tanks, you know, we're uh, increasing our defence uh, forces. Poland is doubling its army. Many countries, eight in the EU, have reintroduced conscription and all of this so you know we, we're good allies we're doing we're doing our bit but I, I, but of course there is the fear uh, that Trump may go further and really try to take the United States out of NATO the question is Kate could he the US Senate has sort of anticipated this and, and even Republicans and, and even Trump loyalists in the US Congress 
do not support the president when it comes to withdrawing from NATO. They may have other feelings about mm. the United Nations and other international organizations. And the Senate has introduced a law to prevent the uh, president to, from renouncing an international treaty without the consent of the Senate. So there would, I think, be a, an interesting sort of legal political tussle here if Trump really decided to uh, uh, do that. But I suppose if you're a, a European, you have to draw very briefly, Kate, two conclusions. Number one is that clearly the Americans are going to be less predictable. We don't know what's going to happen. And therefore, we should prepare for the worst by making sure that we beef up our own defense forces. If we do that, it's good for our defense, but it also shows Trump that we're good allies. So we win on both counts. You know, if, if Trump stays with us, uh, he sees we're good allies. If Trump abandons us, at least we've, you know, uh, strengthened our own defenses so that we're not, you know, completely vulnerable uh, to uh, 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 Russia. Um, so that would be the first, uh, I, I think, uh, con conclusion uh, to draw. The, but the second conclusion, uh, I think, is, is also to realize that even if Biden is re-elected, uh, the Americans will not be able to spend as much on Ukraine as they were spending in the past, uh, where they were uh, assuming the brunt of the effort. They've got Indo-Pacific, they've got Taiwan, China, the situation in the Middle East. So I think the Europeans have to recognize that if they want Ukraine to survive, uh, so assistance, both financial and military, will have to come increasingly from Europe, uh, as there won't be so much from the United States. And I say that even if Joe Biden uh, and the Democrats uh, succeed in uh, uh, keeping the White House. Uh, you mentioned something just now about preparing for the worst, and um, I just wanted to, to focus in uh, briefly on on the Baltics, and in particular because of an interview that was given to the Times newspaper by the German NATO commander charged with preparing the defence of Northeast Europe. This is Lieutenant General Jürgen Joachim von Sandart. Um, yeah. He warned of this, or Sandart, sorry, he warned of this uh, potential nightmare scenario um, during a prolonged war with Ukraine that the Kremlin would seek to, to seize the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania by severing the land bridge between them and Poland. Um, how might that happen and how seriously do you think those kind of warnings should be taken? But an excellent question. Well, there's been a spate of so-called war warnings, haven't there, over the last couple of weeks, you know, even from Grant Shapps, uh, the UK Defence Minister, in a speech in uh, uh, London, and of course, General uh, Sir Patrick Sanders, the head of the UK Army, similar speech yesterday. So we, we've heard a lot of this talk about you know, conscription, uh, increasing reserves, making our civil society, our population more resilient uh, uh, in the event of uh, uh, warfare, uh, defence production, we just spoke about this and of course increasing uh, the size of our, uh, our, our armed forces. Um, I, I think that the answer to that, number one, is if we don't want that to happen, make sure Ukraine doesn't lose. Because of course uh, Ukraine uh, at the moment is the buffer, the strategic sort of depth that keeps Russia away from NATO. Uh, it's putting up a heroic resistance and if the Ukrainians win and join NATO, the Ukrainians will defend NATO in the future with the army that knows more about how to fight and beat Russians than any other army in Europe. So I think, you know, if that is the true scenario, then the first conclusion I would draw is, you know, let's make sure that Ukraine survives because that is our strategic interest. If Putin retreats uh, uh, with his tail between his legs from the battlefield, he won't be in a position to threaten NATO for a long time to come. The second thing is look at uh, Kate, look at Ukraine itself. The lesson is that the defense is massively better than the offense. You know, when the Ukrainians have attacked the Russians, they've lost thousands of troops and thousands of tanks. When the Russians have attacked the Ukrainians uh, to capture one single village uh, near Advika in the Donbass, they have had to accept 20,000 casualties. This is enormous. The lesson of modern warfare with you know, tank traps and fortifications, with loitering munitions, with drones, with uh, sensors, uh, is that you can't move. As soon as you move, as soon as you mass, uh, you're spotted uh, and you're going to be attacked with very accurate weapons and you're going to lose a lot of soldiers. So NATO, I think, has to draw the same conclusion as well. Uh, make it tough for the Russians to do that by looking how the Ukrainians have successfully defended themselves uh, and to have the same kind of defence posture in, in Poland, in the Baltic uh, uh, states. Uh, that probably yeah. means, Kate, also, final bit of this answer, if I may, but probably stationing more NATO forces, like we did in the Cold War, 
permanently on the territory of these countries. Because up until now, the idea has been we only needed a small presence to deter Russia. And if Russia should attack us, we've got bags of time, you know, to mobilize forces across Europe uh, uh, into the Baltic states. Well, given the heightened threat now from Russia, uh, I don't think you can sort of take that sort of laid back. We've got time to respond kind of uh, uh, approach. And it does mean like the Germans have done, uh, the other countries like the UK consider uh, establishing a permanent, at least brigade headquarters and brigade force. Uh, the Germans are now doing that in Lithuania, the Brits are in Estonia, uh, and uh, it, it may be a good idea to try to move in the same direction, more permanently deployed forces. Yes, uh, interesting, uh, because um, from what you're saying, um, am I understanding that you think that NATO is not doing enough at the moment to deter Russia in the Baltics, and that the, the, by permanent stationing of troops, that is what is needed, and needed presumably sooner rather than later? Yeah, it, it's I always thing, you know, when you get into the defense business, like in most aspects of life, it, it's, it's 50 shades of gray rather than, you know, black and white, because um, uh, some of my NATO colleagues would say, you know, Jamie, you're wrong on that, because, you know, if we've got all of our troops in the Baltic states and Russia attacks in the Black Sea, well, we've got our troops in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and so there is an argument in NATO, and this is going to be the tricky thing uh, to achieve a balance uh, uh, between uh, having forces in place on, on the front line, saying, I'm not going to allow you to take an inch of my territory because I don't want to spend six years trying to recapture that territory from you at enormous expense. You know, if you look at what Russia has done to Ukraine in the uh, in the sheer terms of physical destruction, you know, 10, according to the UN uh, this morning, the UN Refugee Agency, you know, 10 million displaced people, 20% of destroyed agricultural production, uh, the worst minefields in the world, 18% of the housing stock deplor uh, destroyed, I could go on. You know, NATO cannot afford a Ukraine scenario. It would take us 25 years and trillions of dollars to recover uh, on the understanding that we would win the battle. So I can well understand the argument for forward defense, don't let them come on our territory. On the other hand, there is a good argument that with such a large frontier with NATO to, def to defend, Kate, uh, you can't put all of your troops in static positions on borders. You need a mobile reserve in Germany, in Poland, uh, which can rapidly go where you see the Russians trying to advance. So it, inevitably, NATO will have to come up with a balance here. But as I've said, the uh, issue of the Ukrainian conflict uh, is that you can, if you mass in large numbers with large number of tanks, you're going to be seen and destroyed. So NATO, therefore, has got to make sure it has sufficient missiles, long range artillery, uh, uh, electronic warfare, you know, jamming, jamming drones, jamming missiles, all of that, so that it's not a, a it, so it, 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 it does not allow the Russians to mass in a way that would allow them to mount a significant military attack. I think that is the one thing, air defense, missile defense, which has been a bit of a gap in NATO since the end of the Cold War and, and now has to be rectified. And looking wide, more widely, how significantly do you think that the war in Ukraine has changed NATO's mission and its role on the world stage? Well, it, it, certainly it's it's been the return to uh, collective uh, defence uh, because uh, there is now clearly uh, a, a major confrontation with, with Russia. And if you look at, you know, at, at Russia from a NATO perspective, uh, uh, you're going to lose a lot of sleep because here you have a country which is militarising. Uh, where uh, children in school, once again, are taught to use weapons, you know, military training, where uh, Russia today is spending a greater percentage, uh, percentage of its GDP uh, on defense than even the Soviet Union. It, it's mobilizing hundreds of thousands of troops. It, it's you know creating a sort of war society and not just a war economy. Putin, to keep in power, has constantly to be involved in a war somewhere, uh, given the way you, you said at the beginning, he sort of you know, conceptualized this as an existential threat to Russia, uh, Russia being invaded, you know, threatened from all sides. So given that, uh, you know, NATO has to also, of course, be prepared uh, to deal with that kind of uh, neighbor. Uh, not an easy situation uh, to be in. Uh, and that's going to take up most of the energy in the years ahead. There's no doubt about that. But the, the question for NATO is to what extent there's still bandwidth to deal with other issues. I mean, you refer to the days when I was a NATO uh, civil servant, and we used to, you know, we were in Afghanistan, we, we still have a mission in Kosovo. Uh, it, the Brits have sent 
additional forces to Kosovo at the end of last year as trouble brewed up there. NATO's got a training mission in Iraq. Um, uh, so there's still a kind of global sort of footprint of NATO, although, although less than when, of course, it had so many troops in Afghanistan uh, after 9-11. The, the uh, leaders of uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea are always invited to show up at NATO summits. NATO communicates talk about China. So NATO's trying to sort of show everybody that, look, you know, we do understand that it's not just Russia. There are all of these other issues in the rest of the world where we want to sort of you know, uh, uh, keep our eyes and ears open and see what's going on. But you're right, Kate, it's not so certain now uh, with the over overwhelming focus on Russia, uh, you know, apart from keeping an eye on the rest of the world, you know, Taiwan, the Asia Pacific, North Africa, terrorist threats, uh, what uh, in, in operational concrete terms NATO will be able to do about it all. What you see in Brussels is a kind of division of labor, you know, leave NATO to do the Eastern Europe collective defense. And who's going to send ships off to the Red Sea to deal with the Houthis? Is it NATO? No, it's the European Union, which uh, is talking about mm. that. Uh, it's been in Africa, the EU recently. It's been dealing with migrants in the Mediterranean. So there's a kind of division of labor between NATO, Central, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and you know, the heavy lifting elsewhere, uh, to the extent it has the consensus and the capabilities that the EU will sort of take on that, that role. We'll see how far we go with that over the next few years. Yeah, and certainly the threat from Russia has changed since the end of the Cold War. In some ways it's diminished, but in others it has increased. How do you think that has changed the way NATO operates as a defensive pact? Well, it, 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 it's certainly been a, a big wake-up call for many allies. I mean, we, we spoke earlier about the fact that, you know, uh, uh, after the Cold War, you know, there was a sense that, you know, Russia would be a prickly partner but wouldn't be a threat and, and would become more democratic. Mm. So that assumption has proven wrong. And, you know, NATO, uh, we had the peace dividend. Uh, the, the Germans uh, had, at the end of the Cold War, over 3,000 tanks and went down to 225. The Dutch had 800 tanks and sold them all off to Latin America. America, you know, there was the peace dividend and this major disarmament. Uh, special forces were all the night, we were all the rage, remember? Uh, because they were the, the, the people who would deal with Osama bin Laden and, and, and terrorist uh, threats. And uh, I spent most of the 1990s, you know, looking about how NATO soldiers could interact with NGOs. Um, and uh, people who would deliver meals on wheels, no joke, in Kosovo and Macedonia, mm. because it was all about peacekeeping, wasn't it? It was all about, you know, helping countries to get back on their feet and using soldiers to deliver services. You know, NATO troops in, in, in Kosovo uh, built flats, uh, repaired railway lines, you know, uh, even delivered uh, the Royal Green Jackets, uh, I was with them in Kosovo, uh, uh, meals to uh, people uh, in snowbound villages. Um, and, and the Reich. And so it's been a bit of a shock, obviously, going from that very sort of broad use of the military uh, to the idea that they are once again warriors and war fighters for, for collective defence. And again, you know, coming back to things that nobody really needed after the Cold War, like long range artillery, uh, armour, armoured personnel vehicles. And, and to some degree, you know, you, you can't do that overnight. Uh, you know, rearming uh, it takes 20 years production and so it's a, a work in, in progress and uh, NATO uh, to some degree has to make sure that no conflict with Russia breaks out before it's ready to fight that conflict hence the importance of Ukraine yes. because Ukraine allows NATO to buy time in a way keeping Russia sort of tied up there uh, so that it can work out what it needs for its own defense on its own territory. And um, in, in that context, that the growing number of voices who are, are, are putting their head above the parapet now and, and talking about the paucity, the real threat of, of a war between NATO and Russia is growing. You have the NATO military commander, Admiral Rob Bauer, saying the military alliance needed to prepare for conflict with Putin's forces in the next 20 years. Germany and Estonia have warned the same kind of thing, but even sooner than that. Um, how long do you think, um, for how long do you think NATO has realistically considered a conflict with Russia as a real possibility? Well, I, I think that uh, 
uh, after 2014, there was a sense that, you know, Russia was once again a strategic challenger to NATO. And that's when you saw the first time, you know, the 2% benchmark for defense budgets to increase. Uh, for the first time, you know, NATO forces were deployed in the Baltic states where they hadn't been before, even after these countries joined NATO uh, in, in 2004. Uh, you had, you know, light battalions. But as I mentioned, Kate, they weren't designed to fight. They were mainly simply the designed to reassure the Baltic yeah. states that NATO had their back and, and to show, show Russia that you know, NATO was once again taking uh, the defense of its member states seriously. But there was a real sense uh, at, at, you know, at, at the time that you know, Russia did not have you know, major territorial ambitions in, 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 in Europe. Uh, uh, you know, we, NATO went ahead by offering the prospect of membership to Ukraine and Georgia uh, and so on. And uh, somehow, you know, by also cooperating with Russia in places like Afghanistan, where the Russians were quite helpful to NATO because they didn't like the Taliban any more than NATO did. And they gave NATO sort of transit rights across Russian territory for its logistics into Afghanistan. That somehow, you know, you could balance the Russians with arms control, with cooperation in Afghanistan, cooperation on terrorism, uh, and, and eventually sort of maintain the status quo in Europe. So yes, I think uh, you, it, we definitely have to look at Putin's full-scale invasion of, 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 of Ukraine. Uh, to the, to see this new sort of alarmism about Russia, particularly as Putin, as I mentioned, has turned Russia uh, into a war economy, a war society. Uh, you can think of you know Hitlerian Germany in the 1930s in terms of a rapid you know militarization, mobilization. Uh, you know it's guns, not butter, in, in Russia uh, uh, today. Uh, and then this sort of feeling that you know whatever NATO tries to do, a war could nonetheless be uh, imposed uh, uh, on it. Um, so, and the, the old things that you f thought could sort of restrain the Russians, like arms control agreements, you know, agreements on reductions in nuclear missiles, agreements on limiting tanks in Europe, the, all, all of the things we had during the Cold War, unfortunately, they've all gone. Uh, the, uh, the only thing that's still left is the START II treaty on nuclear weapons with the United States. So those kind of buffers, those kind of rail guards that were built in that gave mm. you some kind of assurance and confidence uh, have, have, have gone as well. So uh, the mood is, is much gloomier, uh, of course, uh, uh, now. Um, and, you know, the Latin phrase is, if you want peace, prepare for war. And I think that's pretty much the one that NATO is following now. It's interesting because um, I just want to ask you a bit more about something you said earlier about um, how NATO, um, in terms of its preparedness for any conflict with Russia, should be kind of um, uh, what, using this time uh, while it's embroiled in this conflict with, with Ukraine to, to sort of bide its time and get prepared. What, what do you mean exactly by that? Uh, presumably not prolong the war, but do you mean just like while they've got the moment, really get on with preparing uh, deterrence now and preparing for any potential future conflict? Well, I, I think, first of all, in, in, in Ukraine, it's the end of what a US commentator called magical thinking, you know, the hope that, you know, Putin would quickly realize that he'd made a mistake uh, in invading Ukraine, that it was going to be costly for Russia and would seek a face saving way out. That's certainly not the case today. Putin has made it clear that he's doubling down, you know, he's in for the long haul, he's willing to take the losses. Uh, in a way that would be unthinkable for a democratic society to accept those uh, those, those losses. He's mobilising additional troops. He's buying ammunition from North Korea. In fact, he's bought uh, in one single train load more ammunition from North Korea than the EU has been able to supply Ukraine for the past two years, just to give you a sense of the dimensions here. And he's using you know, Iranian North Korean uh, rockets as, 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 as well. Uh, he's increased the, the defence budget, as I've said uh, uh, earlier. So I think the end of magical thinking is that we recognize that there's no quick and easy solution in Ukraine, all the more so as that the Ukrainians, I don't think, are going to be able to mount a new spring offensive next year. Uh, they're going to have to rebuild their army, which has been severely depleted in terms of equipment and manpower from the war thus far. The soldiers in the trenches are exhausted. They need to be replaced. The people coming in are less enthusiastic about fighting. So it's going to take, I think, time. So I think in 2024, not much is going to happen. It's it's going to be a year of the Russians are going to be you know, building up their force, uh, replacing their missile stocks and so on. Uh, the Ukrainians need to rebuild a, a, an army uh, as, as well. Neither side seems willing yet to compromise with peace uh, negotiations. Um, but NATO has got to think very, very clearly, I think, what kind of outcome uh, in, in, in Ukraine uh, 
is best compatible with its security interests. And I think the overwhelming conclusion so far is that a Russian victory in the U Ukraine, where Putin captures the territory, is certainly not compatible with NATO's uh, security uh, uh, I I interests. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, NATO countries clearly need time now that they have committed you know, to ramp up their defense of production uh, once again, to look at the size of their armies. And, and they say they, they are going to need time to sort of carry out those reforms. And of course, it's going to mean, uh, you know, higher defense budgets. The UK talks about going from 2% to 2.5, Poland from 2% to 4% and, and the rest. The, the the one thing which I think is going to be a bit more problematic is, is these things about conscription. Uh, obviously, not easy to <laughs> reintroduce into the UK after we, we you know, abandoned that after the Suez crisis. The British government said there's no, there's no question that that's on the table, any plans for conscription at no. the moment. And my understanding of what the, the chief, the general staff was saying was that he wanted some kind of citizen army uh, to be yeah. established and that would be necessary. Do, do you think it is, having said that, important to start thinking differently about how wars are going to affect all of us in the future? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I, I definitely, I, you know, again, if you want peace, prepare for war. So this is not about fighting as, as much as being in a position that you can keep to deter. What happened, I think, in the case of Russia is that we felt that you know, deterrence would work using sort of economic instruments, uh, you know, that you would could do it with sanctions. You remember the threat of sanctions and putting stops on Russian oligarchs, you know, visiting their homes in the south of France, that that would deter Putin. And uh, those were all rolled out by, before Putin invaded in February 2022. And as you know, Kate, they didn't work. Uh, deterrence failed, just like the Houthis don't seem to be particularly deterred at the moment by UK and US airstrikes repeated uh, on their uh, missile facilities. So I think NATO has to think, you know, very much about what deters, what kind of posture do we have, which really convinces an adversary that don't even start because you're not going to win. It's going to be too costly uh, uh, and, and you know, find other ways of satisfying your foreign policy ambition. So I think that's one thing. I, I think you're right, though. I think the, the missing link in all of this is NATO understands about military forces. It understands about war production. But what do we mean by civil society? You you know, we don't want civil society like in Russia to be on a permanent war footing, uh, you know, with children in school going out on, you know, sort of a, a, a missile uh, a, a, a sort of rifle training or whatever. No, that that's not the way we do things. But we do see, if I can make one point, uh, that we've been using our military over the last couple of years in the UK, like elsewhere, a lot to do sort of civil tasks, you know, deal with floods build Nightingale hospitals during the uh, COVID uh, a, a pan pandemic, uh, you know, deliver fuel trucks to garages uh, during, you know, uh, the strike by the truckers and all of that, um, um, you know, put out forest fires and so on. You know, uh, and I think now that our militaries are once again called on uh, for fighting and combat, what we could look at in the UK, like elsewhere in Europe, is kind of civil protection type forces, uh, you know, citizens who would be quite happy uh, to deal with issues like floods, you know, emer civil emergencies, uh, bad storms, you know, where we often uh, rely so much upon uh, our, our armies um, or, uh, you know, or larger reserves in the military. Because if you take a country like Finland, for example, it has a big reserve uh, of, of people from, you know, sort of 18 to 50 uh, who you know, live perfectly normal lives but who every year have some kind of training. And, and if you do get back into a combat situation, it's easier to use a reservist who every year gets some military training and has got some link with what's going on mm. than to get you know somebody like me and, and sort of try to train them from, from scratch to be a soldier, which of course is going to be difficult and take a long time. So I don't necessarily think it means conscription, but I think it does mean looking at more reservists if you didn't need to mobilize, how could you get the army that you needed quickly? And, you know, taking the military out of some of these things like dealing with forest fires, which could be dealt with with, with some kind of civil protection corps. Think of the National Guard in the United States. And it's down that route that we really need to go. And just finally, um, NATO celebrates its 75th anniversary this year, and it has been suggested that um, Putin by Putin watchers, that he will look for an opportunity to undermine or embarrass the alliance before or around that anniversary, uh, perhaps to coincide with the presidential elections in Russia. Where would uh, or should NATO allies be paying particular attention to avoid giving him that opportunity? 
Well, uh, uh, last question, so last answer. There's, there's been a, a series of what NATO calls hybrid warfare, and NATO's been you know, used to this from Russians for years. Think of Salisbury, you know, the Novichok nerve agent, cyber attacks, uh, cables in the, you know, the Baltic Sea being cut, you know, or, or blown up in mysterious circumstances. Not always by Russia, by the way. You know, the finger of the most recent example has been pointed more at China. Uh, but, you know, GPS signals being interfered with when it comes to civil aviation or, you know, election interference, of course. Uh, uh, that's been a, a big one. But to some degree, you know, because these things have been happening every single day, NATO countries have become rather adept at dealing with them. You know, election interference, uh, people are now looking for disinformation campaigns, cyber attacks, people are on the lookout because they're occurring so frequently. In fact, a major one against Sweden the last couple of days on the brink of its joining finally uh, NATO. Um, and so because you know, the, the West is more on the lookout for this kind of disruptive behaviour, uh, it's not going to deter adversaries from attempting it because it's very cheap and, and you can have deniability. You know, you can pretend that somebody else is doing it, like a cyber attack, a false flag. But it does mean that it's more difficult to have a lot of success uh, with this kind of uh, uh, attack in the uh, future. In, in the meantime, I think Putin, of course, does have his... You know, he is tied down in Ukraine. He's promised a victory in Ukraine, which means that the Russians are going to continue, I think, to lose large amounts of troops and money and equipment there. So I don't personally see that he would try a provocation in the form of, uh, of, of uh, a military attack on a NATO uh, member uh, state. Steadfast Defender, I think, will hopefully convince him that NATO is prepared to deal with that uh, as, as, as well. But what I do see is that, you know, continuing attempt, you know, to rally the global south, North Korea. Korea, Iran, uh, around the you know a narrative that the West is aggressive, the West doesn't care about them. You know, you see the Russians very active today in the Middle East, very active in Africa. You know, in the UN, trying to undermine the Western narrative. You know, uh, about what the West is is doing to convince the rest of the world that we are you know the enemy rather than the friend. Uh, Putin has had some success of, of that, uh, some success in persuading the Europeans that Ukraine's not worth it. We should give in now. Now, you know, make peace, uh, not send more weapons. That that narrative works in many countries, hopefully not so much the UK, but in many other countries it does. So I think it's not going to be a spectacular by Putin. It's going to be this sort of constant trying to undermine the Western position uh, through uh, propaganda, uh, which he's very good at, by the way. Dr. Jamie Shea, great to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you, Kate. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio. My thanks to Louis Sykes, our producer. To support the work of Frontline, hit the subscribe button. You can also listen to Times Radio throughout the day or read it at times.co.uk. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.